Uh, all right. Uh, if you guys can uh, turn to, I uh, see, we did number one on the four, three, four, five review. So let's go to number three. Okay, so um, as a reminder, uh, if you have, it's good if you guys can keep the the graphing calculator uh, handout next to you, because the very back page has the formulas, and we can kind of re refer to those as we work through. Again, uh, the summation formulas, limit definition, uh, area using limit definition is not going to be on the test. Okay, you are responsible to know power rule for derivatives and trig derivatives rule as well. We know that uh, if you know these six rules, you also basically you also know your integral rules as well. You're just working backwards for the antiderivative rules, which I have spelled out down here. But on the test, if you just write this at the top of the page, you have 12 rules in front of you. Okay. Also, um, make sure you know power rule for integrals, right? We've been doing that uh, ever since uh, we started this unit. First theorem, all this is saying is you take the antiderivative and then you plug in upper and lower bound if there are bounds involved, right? Just basically dealing with definite integrals, okay? This is what we're gonna start with. We wanna start with second theorem. I want us to practice with this concept, okay? And I also uh, highlighted trig integrals and average value theorem. We, we did number one on uh, page one with average value theorem. So um, we got some practice with that yesterday. Okay, so let's talk about second theorem. Okay. I'll write this on, um, uh, I'll write the rule again next to number three here. So just as a reminder, I also have it on the board there. Um, second theorem says if I have a function with a lower bound being a variable and upper bound um, being uh, sorry, lower bound being a constant, the upper bound being a variable, and I have some function here. Normally, we would have to take the antiderivative and then plug in upper and lower bound, but this is saying if you're asked to find the derivative of a function that is in this form, then there's going to be a lot of nice properties here because these two operations will just basically kind of undo each other. But then we just have to understand this upper bound variable, it's going to have some lasting impact on the answer. So what's going to happen is this upper bound is going to get inserted into the variable. Okay, we're not we're not having to do a whole lot of calculus here because we have two opposing operations undoing each other. But then this upper bound is also will get impacted by the derivative. So there's also going to be a times P prime of X. Okay, so that's the rule that we want to practice using. So let's look at number th number three here. You have a function that's going from negative two to negative two x squared. Okay, it looks really messy, but ultimately we're not going to have to do a whole lot of calculus. And the reason why is because it's asking for the derivative of this operation of this function. So that's going to take out a lot of the calculus for us. It's just that this upper bound variable is going to have some impact. So looking at how everything is lined up here, what can we do to take care of f of p of x? Good. So that's so if you're starting with f of t and it turns to f of p of x, all we're doing is we're taking every t that we see and replacing it with p of x. That's what this notation is telling us. So everywhere we see the t variable, we're going to go ahead and replace that with negative 2x squared. That's what this f of p of x is telling us to do. OK, we'll clean that up later, but is everybody seeing what this is, what this rule is telling us to do here? Okay, times p prime of x. What is that asking us to do? 
get the derivative of the of the upper bound negative 4x. Now there's also a lower bound here, but this lower bound it will get in uh, it will get in, um, uh, involved with the antiderivative, but then the derivative is just going to wipe it out. OK, so anytime you see a constant, you can ignore it. That a is not going to play a role at all. It's just the variable that's going to stick in, our, in the final answer. OK, any questions so far here? So now we basically have the answer. We're just doing a little bit of cleanup here. I'm going to multiply the numerators together. Negative two times negative four is positive eight. X squared times X is X cubed. And I'm just going to do a little bit of cleanup here. So four plus eight X to the sixth power. Two cubed is eight X. Um, oh, yeah, the four is not cubed because it's outside, yeah. You can reduce this a little bit more. Uh, I have the answer key attached to the back of your packet if you want to look um, or if you want to work ahead. But any variation of this is fine. You can factor out a four and make it a little bit cleaner, but this is fine. Okay, but what I want to do is make sure that we understand um, how to handle a derivative of a, of a function that looks like this. And it's going to be um, a lot of nice properties is going to come out of it. Uh, these cancel out. We just have to worry about what that upper bound does to the function. OK, look at number four. Any questions there? So this is a, this is a test topic, so I want to make sure that as we work through these two examples that you feel comfortable with this. So when you see it on a test, you know what to do. OK, what do you notice about number four? That's a little different here. Yeah, lower bound is also a what? Variable, which means that we have to repeat the process for what we did with the upper bound. So here's a variation of um, second theorem. If I have the derivative of a function that has upper bound and lower bound being variables, I just have to do the same thing that I did with the upper bound. But I start with the upper bound. It's still f of p of x times p prime. But because the lower bound is also a variable, I have to take care of that. So I have to do a minus and then do the um, same thing with the lower bound. Plug in lower bound into the function. Times the lower bounds derivative. OK, so let's see if we can use. Uh, see how number four can. Um, can use the second. Uh, uh, variation here. OK, can you guys try this. See how you can do um, just practice that process. Can you do the same process that you did? with number three, just repeat it not only for the upper bound, but also for the lower bound. That's right, that's right. Integral goes away, dt goes away, d over dx goes away. You're just left with these pieces. Oh, this one here? We gotta do derivative, right? So you gotta write it as x to the one half and then do power rule. Right, right. Okay. Okay, let's do f of p of x here. What does f of p of x look like? 
Okay, good. So all we're doing is this f of p of x says take the upper bound and just insert it directly into the function. Okay. Um, okay, so that's my f of p of x, but I also need to multiply it by the upper bounds derivative. And three root x, I do need to get it ready for power rule, so it's really three x to the one half, right? That's the the cleaned up version that I need for power rule. So to do power rule uh, for derivatives, I bring the one half down and subtract one from the exponent. Okay, so there's my f of p of x. There's my p prime. Any questions there? Okay, repeat the same process now for the lower bound because the lower bound is not a constant, it's a variable. So minus. Yes. Uh, oh, you mean like, you mean the cleanup for this? Yes, yeah. Uh, uh, I can bring that x of one half down to the denominator. I'll clean that up later, but yeah, we'll. No, I mean like when oh. you when you do your um derivative for your antiderivative for like the first part, like the first part of the part. Oh no, uh, but this is this is not the antiderivative though. This this p prime is finding the derivative. Right, right. So so p prime. is we bring down the exponent and we subtract one from the exponent. Does that make sense? Yeah, so P prime means we find the derivative because there's a D over DX out here. That is going to, that's causing that derivative to happen. And it's not, I know you're maybe thinking it's X to the three halves over three halves, but that's not, um, that's not. We did though. For number three, we um, uh, we plugged in the upper bound, and then we multiply it by the upper bound's derivative. So negative two x squared becomes negative four x. Right, because that that's not what p prime is saying, right? P prime is saying find the derivative, right? Does that make sense here? I know you're seeing this integral feeling that you got to do the integral process, but that integral process is going to get wiped out because we're we're undoing that integral with the derivative. So these two operations cancel each other out, but this derivative will kind of have this lasting impact on that p of x. So that's why there's that p prime there. Okay, so it's kind of confusing, I know, because you're seeing this integral uh, notation, but you're not doing anything with antiderivative because the derivative is wiping that operation out. That's why. OK, minus f of q of x. What's next? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Times negative 1, yeah. Not negative x squared over 2, because that's the antiderivative. It's the derivative, so it's just negative 1. Yeah, so I guess, yeah, I understand that confusion there. There's that integral procedure, but we don't do anything with antiderivatives because this operation is kind of taking that antiderivative procedure out. Okay, let's do some cleanup here. The two negatives cancel out. I'm just left with plus one plus two x. If I uh, just kind of do some cleanup here, distribute the numerators together, I can get three minus 18 root x. OK, so there's a couple different ways of cleaning up and um, as long as you can 
produce some version of a cleanup. That's that's all I'm looking for. I think on my key, I even split up into individual fractions and combine more like terms, but this is fine. OK, any questions with uh, the second theorem here? So this is a test topic. I want to make sure that you know, any questions that you guys have can can be answered here. Yes, question. Well, I um, it is, but then I also multiply by negative one. So what I did was I brought the negative one in front and I just canceled that to be positive and I just took that uh, the parentheses as it is. So positive one and positive two X. OK, good. Any other questions with um, second theorem? OK, let's look at uh, the bottom of the page. This is um, even and odd functions. OK, this is also a test topic, so put a star next to it. Uh, I want to highlight a couple of steps here as we um, uh, build our graph. OK, and I think uh, these steps will will I'll keep referring to this. You can copy this down or. Um, OK, but what we want to do is understand that when we're dealing with even and odd functions, we're dealing with graphs that are either uh, mirror images or opposite canceling out with odds. OK, so even functions are mirror images. Odd functions, you're going to create e equal but opposite properties on either side of the y axis. So I believe if we kind of go through these steps here, uh, we can kind of avoid some um, um, mistakes that I've seen in the past. So, first thing you do is you start with the shortest or the smallest bounds interval. Okay, so here between negative three and six, and zero and three, which one covers a, a shorter or smaller interval? Zero to three, okay. Don't look at the, the value of the antiderivative. Look at whatever um, involves a smaller or shorter interval, okay? That's what you want to start with, okay? Now, we want to put this onto a graph, and if we're putting something onto the graph, we prefer to go from a smaller to a larger value. So what's off about this integral here? Or is, in, is there another way that we can rewrite this? What do you notice about the bounds here? Lower yeah, lower bound is higher. That usually is not a problem if you're just doing antiderivative and you're just um, going through the procedure of power rule. But here we're trying to get a visual picture of it. So it is visually helpful if I can rewrite it with the bounds in the proper order. So we can read from left to right. So if I were to force the bounds to change, what also needs to change? The signs, right? So if the definite integral from three to zero is negative four, then the integral from zero to three must be what? Well, it's already negative four here. So yeah, positive four. So I gotta change the sign here. So this is what I'm going to start off with. I'm going to create a graph with that picture. OK. OK, so the way we do that is. We're going to sketch a graph out. So part A is going to be an even function. So let's sketch our function here. I know that I'm my graph is going to be mirror images on both sides of the y-axis. So this is my smaller interval here from 0 to 3 is 4. So I'm just going to create an area. Positive 4 means above the x-axis. So that's what I have to begin with. OK, any questions there? OK, the second thing I wrote down here is before you do anything else, go ahead and fill out even odd property that you can gather on the other side of the y-axis. So before we move on to this uh, second property here, if this region is a positive four from zero to three, and it's an even function, what do you know about the other side? Same thing, from negative three to zero, 
we're also going to get a positive four. Okay, so I'll, I basically want to kind of build my uh, my graph out before I get to this messier, uh, larger interval. Okay, does that make sense with steps one and two here? Now we're going to try to graph the remaining property. Okay. So look at the remaining property here. What do you notice about the remaining property? Yeah, see how it overlaps? So I want to kind of show you what I don't want us to do because this is something common that students do. They see that the, the region from negative three to six is 10 and they want to do this. A lot of students want to do this. They want to overlap this whole region and call it 10. But if you do that, then you're kind of undoing the process that this is for and you're creating a region above it and that's just going to make it confusing. So we don't want to do that, okay? What you do want to understand is that this four and four, those are set in stone, okay? We don't want to change any value inside that interval. We just want to fill out the remaining intervals that has nothing, uh, nothing um, uh, set yet. Good, so I want to uh, make sure that we understand that the full region is going to add up to be 10, okay? It's going to add up to be 10. So you know this region is going to add up to be 10, you already have four and four shown, so what's what's left then? Two, because four plus four plus two is equal to 10. Does that make sense? You never want to overlap. If you overlap, then you're kind of undoing the work that you've that you've uh, accomplished here. So you want this region to be two. Okay, so we're not putting a full region of 10. We have to understand that if we're doing, if you're if you're creating overlapping regions, you already have some parts set. You just have to fill out the remaining part. OK, so now the last step, fill out the other side using even odd properties. This is still an even function. If this is two, what else do we know? It's also two. OK. Now we can answer part A. Part A says if g of x is even, Find the depth integral from negative six to three. So now we're just we're not going to add everything up. We're just going to add up the regions that the problem is asking for. So negative six to three. What are those numbers going to add up to be? Two plus four plus four is ten. OK, any questions with part A? Okay, part B, same properties, just a different type of function. It's an odd function, which means that whatever we create on one side, we're gonna create an equal but opposite property on the other side. Okay, so let's start off with the, with the same um, order of steps here. We're gonna start with the shortest interval. We already have zero to three is four, so we'll start there. As soon as you uh, have your shortest um, interval property on paper, your next step is fill out the other side. All right. So what do I know about the other side now that I have four showing? Negative four. Good. Odd function, I'm going to create equal but opposite on the other side. Good. Yeah. OK, are we good so far? Now, let's move on to step three, graph the remaining property. The remaining property is showing 10, okay, negative 3 to 6. Let me get uh, all the intervals showing, negative 3 to 6. Again, I don't want to do any overlapping. I just want to kind of put to the side that I, I need these numbers to add up to be 10. OK, think of it that way, add up to be 10. So negative 4 plus 4 is what? 0 plus what equals 10? 10. Okay, again, there's no overlapping. This number is to kind of help tell us what, how to fill out the missing parts that is not showing yet. Now that we have the remaining property filled out, uh, let's do the other side, okay? 
it's, it's still an odd function here. If this is 10, what can we put on the other side? Negative 10. Okay. Any questions here? Okay, so now it's the easy part. The easy part is just adding the, the values that you see in front of you. We're just going to go from 0 to 6, though. We're not going to add all these numbers up. 0 to 6. What do we get? 14. Okay, this is a test topic. If you follow these steps, you're not going to make a mistake, but is everybody comfortable with those steps and with those uh, properties? Okay, let's go to the second page. Let's do some uh, use substitution problems here. All right, page two. OK, uh, uh, page two, let's go down to number seven. OK, let's talk about number seven for a moment here. Uh, take the integral of two over x squared, secant of three over x, tangent of three over x. Now, anytime you see an integral problem, you want to ask yourself, can is there one rule that can handle all this? OK, and there is no rule that can handle all this. OK. Some of you may be looking at this going, well, can I just split it up, right? I can do power rule here, a trig rule here, a trig rule there. You can do that if there was a plus or minus separating each term. But with multiplication, that's all they're all connected. It's not as flexible as you would like where you can pick and choose different rules across multiplication, OK? So this is one big rule, and we don't have a, a rule that can handle this one big problem. So we have to go through use substitution, OK? So if we're going to use substitution, How do we approach the u value? Where, where do we look? Parentheses. Good, parentheses, OK? Down the road, you're going to see problems that are not quite always the parentheses, but it's always a good place to start. OK. Parentheses, parentheses, dx. Those are your priorities right now, OK? Use substitution. Now, you may be looking at this going, this is kind of strange, right? This is x to the first power, this is x squared. How is that going to cancel out? But they're in the denominator. So denominator variables kind of have a um, different uh, pattern because of negative exponents. So, uh, but things will things will work out the way we expect it, okay? Or the way that we want, okay? So u is equal to 3 over x. Okay, I want to find the derivative, but before I find the derivative, what can I do to make it easier so I don't have to stare at a quotient yes. rule problem? Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot easier to find the derivative. It's a lot less messy rather than go through quotient rule. Okay, so now let's find du dx. Okay, what's the derivative of 3x to negative 1? Mm -hmm. uh, yep, derivative power rule. Okay. Bring down the negative 1, subtract 1 from the exponent. And now we're just going to clean this up and get it so that dx can be replaced with something, right? We want to solve for dx. Okay. okay I'll cross multiply to try to get that dx by itself. Okay, solve for dx, what can I do? Good, divide by the negative 3, okay? All right, so we're ready to substitute into our original problem. You're going to copy everything that you see. The only thing you're going to replace are the ones that we underline, right? We're just replacing the parentheses and the dx. Everything else is going to... in our 
problem. All right. Remember that we can't move forward with the integral rule unless the x's go away. Do the x's go away? Okay. Do the x's go away? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Are there leftover coefficients? Uh, close. Negative two thirds. Okay. It's okay to have to have coefficients. That's not going to prevent us from moving forward, but we do need to keep track of them. Okay. So where can we put that negative two thirds? In front. Okay. Now I see some students do this. Uh, I see some students take a leftover x and put it outside the integral. We can't do that. Okay. We can't put it outside the integral and pretend like it's not there. If there's a leftover x, we got to deal with it. Okay. Otherwise, uh, we can't use the rule that that we that we want to use. So, any uh, coefficient you can kind of cover up temporarily and ask yourself, is there a rule that looks exactly like this one here? Yeah, look at your integral rule here. You know the derivative of secant is secant tangent, right? And so the integral of secant tangent must be secant u plus c, right? It's this rule here. All right, so we have a perfect match with the rule that we want to use. And now we can apply that rule. The negative two thirds just tags along. Okay, so as soon as you take the antiderivative, the integral du drops out plus c takes takes the place of it. Uh, there are no bounds, so that's why we have a plus c. But we're close. But is this the final answer? Okay, what's the final step here? Good. So remember, if you're doing if you're doing u substitution, keep in mind that your variable u is a temporary variable. It's there to kind of help us solve the problem easier to make things match and and feels a little bit cleaner but once we get to the end we have to bring the original variable back okay u is only a temporary variable no they're not because the three is inside the secant and that three is not the same place as this three okay so they're kind of having to be um both part of the answer Okay, questions with seven. Yes. Um, in the beginning of the problem, how did you do the how did you put the negative three x out from negative two? Like, yeah, so a, neg a negative exponent, I just brought it down to the denominator to make it easier for me to cross multiply and just solve for dx. Okay, good. All right, any other questions with seven? Yes. See, I want subtracting. I subtracting one. That's right. We're doing the derivative. So that's why u substitution is a little bit more involved here because we have to go through derivative uh, as well as integral. So basically, that's to say that even though derivatives was first semester, we're not we're going to need derivatives this semester as well because we need it as a, a, a starting point before we can do our integral. Yeah. So so. We're not going to forget about these derivative rules. We're going to use them still a lot this semester. How is the three okay, how's the three negative? Yeah. Um, because when we do power rule, we multiply, we bring the exponent down in front. So three times negative one is negative three, and then we subtract one from the exponent. Right. We always bring the exponent down first, and then we subtract one. Okay, number eight. Okay, integral of 5x squared of 2 minus x. Okay, there's no trick here. Everything is uh, in terms of x. So we should always ask ourselves, uh, can I rely on power rule? Can I distribute my way through this problem and just rely on power rule? No, I can't. Okay. There's too many terms inside the radical. Uh, if I try to do that, I'll be breaking uh, rules um, involving order of operations. So, but we always want to explore that. We always want to look at the problem. If there's just X's involved and there's no trig, uh, we want to say, okay, can I just rely on power rule? Okay, that's always option number one. If that doesn't work, then option two is use substitution. Okay, 
So I keep I keep stressing that because I think we're going to get to a point where you're going to feel like use substitution is your first option. But once you do that, then you're going to be you're going to be um, um, potentially missing out on a problem that's meant for power rule. And you can't do a power rule problem using use substitution. So we always want to do a quick, you know, um, glance at the problem and consider, can I just do power rule? OK, that should be a quick decision. OK, here we know we can't. So we have to go through your substitution, but to go through your substitution, what do we want to appear to make easier to, to yeah, parentheses. Let's get that parentheses to show up. OK, now we get this. Now we see the parentheses. We can target uh, the portion inside the parentheses as our U value. And we start our process. Our u value is 2 minus x. What's the derivative? Negative 1, right? 2 goes to 0. Negative 1 x becomes negative 1. Solve for dx. OK, what trouble are we going to run into here? Yeah, the x is not going to go away. It's not. An easy exponent, right? We would prefer this problem to be 2 minus x squared because then the x can cancel out. So we just know that there's some additional step we have to do because the x is not going to go away on its own. OK, so let's copy everything back into our problem. The only thing we're replacing is what we underlined in red. OK, what's sticking out here? That X, OK, that X is a problem. Now I see some students do this. They try to pull the, pull the five X in front and they'll do the power rule for you to one half. OK, we can't just push it that X to the side and ignore it. OK, or we can't do this. We can't do power rule here and power rule here. Anytime you have multiplication, um, it's not as flexible as you would like. So we have to find a way to get that X to be replaced. Is there something that we can use to help us get that X to go away? Good. So here's our U substitution equation. Let's rearrange it, and that's going to help us get that U to be uh, replaced. Okay. So if I solve for x here, I can add x to the right, subtract U to the right, uh, to the left. Uh, sorry, add x to the left, and subtract U to the right. So this is rearranged. This will be x equals two minus U. So this is going to go into that x spot. OK, it doesn't mean that we're going to immediately be able to find the antiderivative, but at least. We have a pathway there. Yes, at the very end, our U variable is still a is still a, uh, a temporary variable. You still got to bring your X back in. Yeah, and I think that's why a lot of students with this type of problem. Don't replace it in terms of X because they feel like they've already made the substitution. So I think I, I think that is something that I notice a lot. Students typically uh, remember to put the X back into the problem, but for this type of problem, because you went through the substitution already, you feel like you don't have to make another substitution. But just remember your U is your temporary variable. OK, so we'll talk about that. OK, are we OK up to this point? OK, we have to do a, a whole bunch of cleanup here, right? Distribute a whole bunch of things here to make it a little bit easier so I don't distribute so many things at, at different points in time. What if I just pull the, the individual terms together in front and it's just distribute that term through the parentheses? So what I mean by that is, what if I just put the 5, use it to 1 half and negative 1 all together in front, and that way I don't have to distribute all those terms separately. Does that make sense? That way now I can just do it all at once rather than, you know, do the five and then do the U and do the negative one. I can just do it all at once. OK, distribute. So this gives me again. Negative 10 U to the one half. 
there's a hidden exponent here. So what is this going to give us? We add exponents, right? We get, yeah, three, three halves. OK, any questions so far? This is another mistake that I see is I see students get up to this point and you've done so much work, right? You've done so much algebraic work that you feel like you've reached the end. And I see students, they just end the problem here. OK, but this is only the starting point for our calculus, right? We haven't done any real calculus at this point. We still have to find the true uh, work, which is finding the antiderivative. OK, so just make sure that when you go through this process that you know where you are in the process, that you haven't reached the end yet. We're still one step away. We still got to do power rule. OK. All right, so power rule. Now this is antiderivative. Now we add one to the exponent and divide it by that new exponent. Okay. So this is three halves over three halves. And then five halves over five halves plus C. Okay, flip those fractions up. Multiply the coefficients together. And I know that you already went through a, a U substitution uh, uh, replacement twice, but you're still sitting at U. Right, so we got to do a, another substitution to bring the X back into your answer. Yeah, so what you guys said about this substitution is giving me insight as to why um, in previous years I, I keep seeing students do, you know, bring the X back, but for this problem, they would not bring the X back. And I think I, I think I finally know the reason why is because you made a substitution already and you feel like that's that's all you need to do. All right. So here you got to do a lot of substitutions because you have to still bring that X back into your answer. OK, let's see if we can squeeze one more problem in. Let's try number nine. Any questions with eight? I'll leave this up for a second. All right, so number nine. I'll unfreeze in a moment. OK, are we good? Anybody still need this? OK, so here's number nine. All right, what's different about this problem? Has bounce. Has bounce. Do we do the bounce first? Good, so bounce is the first thing you see, but it's the last thing you do. So anytime you see an integral problem, I know that we okay. I know we plugged in the bounds for second theorem, right? But we do that because there's a we're we're undoing that integral process. That's why we plug the bounds in. But normally for integral with bounds, we don't plug the bounds in at the beginning. So if it I think it helps rewrite the problem without the bounds so that you can kind of force yourself to do the problem without the bounds because the bounds is not going to do it's not going to be involved until the very very last step so if you keep seeing the bounds in front of you i think that may tempt you to to use it before before you're ready so another way to think about the bounds is imagine you work through the problem until that plus c shows up right that plus c is where the bounces will appear in place of okay so until the plus c appears you're, the bounce is not going to is uh, is not going to play a role at all Okay, so instead of plus C, the bounds will, will be the ones um, involved in the process. OK, we saw something similar to this on the quiz. How do we handle this problem? Okay. 
Yeah, split into fractions, right? We can do that because there's only one term in the denominator. I see some students bring the square root of x up to the top as x to the negative one half. You can do that, but then you can be potentially uh, forgetting that you got to distribute through the parentheses anyways. So um, I feel like the the way that um, is easier and more foolproof is to write it as, a, as separate fractions. That way you're forcing yourself um, to involve the denominator for every term. Every term is going to have to deal with that denominator, root x. Okay, every we have to get each term ready for power rule. How can I resolve this here? X to the negative one half, right? Yeah. And then you add exponents. Okay, you can do that, or you can subtract exponents, right? You divide variables, you can just subtract exponents. There's a hidden one here, one minus one half is one half, so it's really x to the one half, okay? How can I rewrite this second term? Negative one half. Okay, am I ready for my bounds? No, okay, do I have to do the, do the full power rule before at the very end, okay? I know it's tempting to involve the bounds here, but we're still not ready for it. Do power rule first, get everything basically cleaned up, and then your final step, right? You got to do the calculus before you can work the bounds in. Okay, so now power rule. Okay, there's no plus C for bounds, right? Instead of plus C, we're going to work the bounds in. Okay, so that's that's the that's where the bounds come in. I'm going to do some cleanup here though, and then I'll work the bounds in. So I can flip those fractions up. Half bracket for the bounds. Upper bound gets used first. Okay, plug the nine in first. Once you take care of the upper bounds, set a big set of parentheses, and then you can now work in the lower bounds. Okay, this is basically the answer, but I want to talk about how we can go a little further without the use of a calculator. I know this feels messy to do, right? Nine to the three halves, right? Raising nine to the third power and take the square root. It's like, how do, how, how do we do that without a calculator? What we do is we don't do it in that order. We do the square root first, and then we raise it to the higher power. Right, it's a lot easier that way, right? And that can allow you to do some things that you feel like you wouldn't be able to do without a calculator. Okay, what's the square root of nine? Three, and then three to the third power is 27. Okay, so that's how you handle problems that, that feel difficult to do um, with radicals and with um, rational exponents. Okay, so here, square root of nine, that's pretty straightforward. Two times, that's square root of three, so two times three. Same thing here, four to the third power, that's not too bad, but it's easier to do the square root first, right? So what's square root of four? And then two to the third power is eight. Okay, so uh, distribute the negative through, Square root of four is two, two times two is four. Okay, do some more cleanup here. 27 divided by three is nine, nine times two is 18. Don't have to clean up it up all the way. You can leave your answer unsimplified. You can, you can go a little further if you like. Ultimately, um, anything that is in uh, numeric form is considered correct on the AP exam as well. You don't have to do cleanup. You don't have to combine like terms to earn full credit. But I just want to highlight that when you see definite integrals, the bounds are the last thing that you do. You got to do it, do the full problem. And the final, final step, once you take the antiderivative, 
you can work the balance in. Okay, we'll continue uh, test review tomorrow. Uh, I have uh, help sessions coming up this afternoon at 3.40, tomorrow morning at 7.30. Uh, it'll be in class, but it'll also be on Teams. I'll send you guys a link if you want to join. Otherwise, uh, they'll be recorded. You can watch the recording if you like as well.